This, that was a hard act to follow. I feel very honored to be sharing the stage with my fellow speakers. I'm here to explore if diversity can help us feed our future. So I'm sure you're all familiar with our dire food, food future predictions, but just to make sure we're all working off the same script today, I'm going to take a minute to make sure we're all on the same page. In the next 30 years, global population growth is expected to reach around 10 billion people. The real estimate's 9.7 billion, but we're going to call it 10 for the purposes of our conversation today. Experts think that we will need to grow more food in the next 30 years to feed that growing population than we have in all of human civilization. We're going to need to increase our production by about 60 to 70%. If that wasn't a big enough challenge, we're going to have to do so in the era of climate chaos, meaning we will have to grow more food than ever with fewer resources and a lighter environmental footprint than ever before. That is the food future problem statement in a nutshell. And I know that we all have plenty of things that keep us up at night and give us anxiety, ranging from the immediate to the existential, but I'd like to argue that food is worthy of our attention because it is so interwoven into the fabric of our lives. Indeed, food is sustenance. Without it, we would all perish. It is the thing that allows us to grow from a fragile, tiny baby into a sophisticated adult, where it is what continues to fuel our best ideas and our physical pursuits. But food is more than just survival. You know that when the smell of something can transport you back in time and remind you of a beloved relative, or when a holiday just isn't quite right without that certain special dish. Or when you know that you have officially rank, joined the ranks of the adulting world when you have been entrusted with that secret family recipe. When those things are true, you know that food is more than just survival. In my family, by the way, that recipe is for summer salad, and there are about 15 things that need to happen that aren't on the recipe card for it to turn out the way my grandmother makes it. Food is indeed how we build tradition. It is fundamental to the way that we celebrate birthdays, anniversaries, big life achievements. It is also how we love people and show up for them in birth, in sickness, in loss, and in death. But we know that these connecting, healing, life-sustaining benefits are not shared equally across the globe and they are not shared equally within our own communities. Currently, there are about two billion people who do not have regular access to safe, nutritious, and sufficient food, showing that we clearly have systemic problems meeting the needs of the existing population today. What's more concerning is that after decades of decline in the global risk for hunger, 2015 marked a turning point where we started to see an increase in the risk of global food insecurity and hunger, according to joint research by the World Health Organization, the United Nations, and others. And in a world that is polarized on nearly every topic, food is no different. Our politics and our political discourse around food remains locked in an us versus them debate. We talk about food as biody biodynamic versus GMO, as organic versus conventional, as small versus big, as my way in values versus yours. But to feed a problem to solve a problem as big as feeding 10 billion people in the next 30 years, we are not going to be able to do that in sound bites. We are going to have to move beyond our loops of division, and we're going to have to move beyond our positions of vitriol. To solve a problem that big, we are going to need to work together. When we talk about the solutions of the myriad of things that we could and should be doing to feed that population over the next 30 years, almost always what we end up deciding we need to do is focus on innovation. And indeed, most of our thought processes right now are around that old adage of doing more with less. Indeed, just a few weeks ago, the United States Department of Agriculture, the USDA, released a legacy challenge to the United States to increase our production by 40% re while reducing our environmental footprint by half in the next decade. Now, in order to do something as bold as that, I'm going to naturally lead to the next topic, which is that of diversity. Now, we could define diversity in a number of ways. We could think about representation in terms of ethnicity, race, 
gender, sexual orientation and gender identity, ability, geography, age, lived experience, religion, just to name a few. For the purposes of our conversation today, I want you to think about yourself being in a room, be it a boardroom or a classroom, and I want you to think about who's at the table with you. Ideally, the people at the table with you are going to have different ideas than you do, partly because they have different backgrounds, experiences, and cultural norms to pull from. Now, why can diversity, sitting at the table in a room with people who do not look or think or love or express themselves like you do, how can that help us feed 10 billion people? Simply put, because diverse teams are more innovative. Research compiled by the Harvard Business Review and McKinsey and Company shows that diverse teams are more objective, objective and careful when discussing facts. That's partly because we each come to the table with our own biases. And when we sit down at the table with people who have different biases than ours, they can challenge us and hold us accountable. Diverse teams generate more solutions to any given problem. They create more innovations. And in circles where this matters, it's worth noting that they're more profitable as well. When we look at the status of agriculture today, we know we have a lot of work to do in this realm. According to census data from the U.S. Census in Agriculture in 2017, there were 13 times more whites involved in agriculture in the United States than all other races combined. There are far more than double the number of men than women currently engaged in agriculture. Now, these two things, that business case for diversity, the state of affairs for where we are and how far we have to go, have led to a national consortium to form called Together We Grow, an organization of which I feel very grateful to be at the helm. Together We Grow represents business interests from some of the largest agribusiness interests in the world, colleges of agriculture from land-grant universities across the country, as well as national NGOs and government agencies who have been meeting since 2016 to think more critically about how we bring more people to the table to solve some of these big processing problems in agriculture. Not only is there a business case for why diversity matters, but in an industry that is fundamentally <laughs> important to the survival of our species, this industry in particular should better reflect the people that it serves. Now, we know that it is not enough just to invite more people to the table. As you hear throughout the day today, it is not enough to create space if people don't feel that we have created the kind of inclusive cultures where they can bring them full selves to the table. Just like the radishes in this picture, the good stuff is below the surface. And so to be sincerely successful in this endeavor, we need to create the kind of inclusive cultures that allow people to bring their full stories and their full selves. Now, I personally became interested in agriculture because I've always cared about public health. And if you care about public health, you care about equity. And if you care about equity, you care about the systems that create inequitable outcomes. The first time I engaged with the system that creates, that grows my food, was after my undergrad, and I was visiting a friend who had just moved on to a small farm in southwest Colorado. The coffee we had in the morning had milk fresh from their cows. It was sweetened with a little bit of honey from their bees. The breakfast we ate was full of vegetables freshly harvested, and I was completely smitten. Since then, I've done a lot of work in local food policy and agriculture and food systems and most recently worked for a national nonprofit that built school gardens and brought food literacy curriculum to mostly low-income urban schools across the country. When you work in schools, you realize how important food is. It's worth noting that one in seven kids in our country are at risk of hunger, they're food insecure, which is part of the reason that schools are so important. Simply put, our kids were getting some of their only meals at school through the school lunch and breakfast program. But food is more than just an important source of nutrition that is important for academic success, particularly for food at risk kids. But it is also a connecting point. It is a way to speak a common language if you are a new arrival from a faraway land. It is a source of pride, particularly if you are sharing something with your community that you have grown yourself. 
And my favorite interactions were looking, were working with middle and high school students and seeing them start to engage with agriculture beyond just what was on their plate. Working with kids who were starting to think about food as a way to solve things like climate change, social justice issues, and health. Indeed, agriculture is one of the best places that we can start to arrive at solutions for some of these big intractable problems. When we talk about the kind of solutions that will drive the innovation we need to feed 10 billion people in the next 30 years, almost always we're talking about the technology solutions. And we talk a lot about the promise of things like precision agriculture, drone technology, sensing technology, genomics, precision breeding. We talk a lot about the things that we can do from a technology standpoint to grow more with less. But rarely do we talk about the people who are going to power this kind of innovation, the individuals who we need to come with their best and brightest ideas. In 2050, it is easy to feel like that is a very long way off. It is easy to feel like 30 years away from now is so far. And I feel that way sometimes as well, until I realized that my middle child is going to be my age in 2050. And I feel youngish, at least I feel young until I step on a college campus. <laughs> and um, I certainly feel like I have a lot of life ahead of me. When I think about the world that my daughter and her two brothers are going to be looking into when they're my age, it seems more likely than not, frankly, on many days, that we are going to have failed to move beyond our sound bites, that we are going to have failed to come together that we will stay in this place of polarization. But I remain eternally optimistic, and I'm certainly going to work my butt off to ensure that we bring more people to the table, that we allow kids today to benefit from our ability to sit down with people who don't look or love or feel or express themselves in the same way that we do. Because I think that's the only way that we're going to solve the big problems, and that's the best chance we have at feeding the future. Thank you. Thank you.